Okay, let's get rolling. So my name is Reza Satchew, and just quickly, I want to give a quick shout out to all the Section H and LTVers that are in the crowd here. Right. Um, okay, so I know you guys are very busy, especially the day before a long weekend. So I'm uh, I'm surprised so many people showed up. Um, so let me start with Nanga. Why are you here? in being an entrepreneur. Mm -hmm. uh, earlier this year, I thought about what was the most important thing to me, either freedom or stability, and I chose freedom. And for me, being an entrepreneur is probably going to be the greatest path right. towards and that. And so what's going to block you from being that entrepreneur? Fear. Fear of what? Um, failure mm -hmm. or weighing that instability and uncertainty too highly. Mm -hmm. OK, why don't you pass it to Mayor? What about you, Mayor? Why are you here? I want to hear Kevin's real thoughts. I'm mm -hmm. excited. And what, particularly, what question do you want to ask him? I want to ask him what he thinks is the greatest weakness of everything he hears today. Interesting. And what do you, what do you think it might be? Well, I have full faith in all the pitchers today, but I do think it potentially is their business models. Let's see. Mm -hmm. All right, Andrew. <laughs> so are you, can, can you imagine yourself being an entrepreneur? I think so, yeah. Yeah. And why would you want to imagine yourself as an entrepreneur? Uh, because of, I think, two things. One, I'm tired of complaining about things that I want to do better and maybe do them. And then second, and thanks to a certain professor this year, it's, mm -hmm. I'm learning that it's not as risky as, as I might have initially thought. Yeah. So it's interesting, right? If you take Nongo's point, which is freedom, I actually think that people want to become an entrepreneur. There's lots of sort of peripheral reasons like power, control, money, and then we go to freedom. But I actually think the freedom piece is really about the freedom to have a positive impact on the people you care about, right? And that can be your family, that can be your community, that can be the world. But yet, there are so many people who will sit in this audience and will dream about that, but will hesitate, okay? So what will be the cause of your hesitation? Uh, the fear that I think somebody else can do it better or that I'm not, you know, there's a lot of holes in what I wanna do. Mm -hmm. All right, Ori, what are your thoughts? What do you most hope to learn from the next hour? What would make this hour valuable for you? I think candor, and I think Kevin is pretty good at that, sometimes to his listeners' detriment. <laughs> uh, but I want to hear his honest thoughts. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And for you, you, you desperately want to be an entrepreneur. Yeah. Yeah. And so if I said to you that the stats would say that, you know, maybe you'll become an entrepreneur, but it's hard to believe that you're going to become as successful as you hope to become, what emotion does that bring up in you? I think statistics are about averages, and I don't think I'm average, so. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Good. OK. I, uh, I remember when I met Kevin 20 years ago, a classmate of mine from here introduced me to him. And um, we started building a business together. And he said to me one day over a drink, and Linda's wife is here, and um, she'll remember this. Or I'm sure she, he said it to her before he said it to me, but he said, I want to be a star. I want to be a star. This is someone who, at the age of 50, had never been on TV beforehand. OK? He said, I want to try this. So let's see how he's done. Can we roll the video? come in here not knowing your numbers. This is the Shark Tank. We're going to kill you. People ask me all the time, why are you so mean on Shark Tank? I'm not mean. I'm just telling the truth through the experiences I've lived. If yeah. you guys loved it so much, how come not a dime from any of you? A lot of people see me as the harsh guy on Shark Tank. It's so not true. Would you rather have me lie to you because I'm worried about your feelings? I don't care about your feelings. I care about your money. A shark that is disingenuous that tries to keep you feeling good when they know your idea has no merit is doing you a huge disservice. Today, I'm really proud to be an entrepreneur and to help entrepreneurs so they can create jobs. You don't start a business out of greed or the pursuit of money. You do it for the pursuit of freedom. But I realized in the early years, I didn't have a lot of time for my young kids. I was so busy with my business. So now I try and spend as much time as I can with them. Everything you see around you here, I made myself. I worked like hell for it. And I'm not embarrassed about it. I'm proud to be a capitalist. Today I spend a lot of time teaching. 
I tell students, you don't start a business out of greed. It's not about money. Why do you want to be an entrepreneur? To set yourself free. The pursuit of entrepreneurship is about freedom and helping others achieve their goals at the same time. I work. People always ask me, why do you keep going? And here's my answer. If you want to help someone, anyone, anywhere in the world, the best thing you can do is to create a job for them. Who does that? Entrepreneurs. I'll spend the rest of my days encouraging people to do exactly what I have done. Become an entrepreneur, start a business, and create jobs, and above all, support others who want to do the same. For me, entrepreneurship and the freedom it gives is the essence of life. Kevin O'Leary. Hey, bud. All right. I think you want to go there. Over there? Yeah, you go there. Thank you, everybody. I really appreciate it. Okay, so, O'Leary, I'll ask you the same question. Yeah. Why are you here? Um, I am here for two specific reasons today. One is I would like to share uh, attributes of a successful pitch if you're an entrepreneur. I have seen tens of thousands of pitches, and it turns out there are three attributes that are present in all successful pitches. It does not determine the outcome of the business. It determines the journey that starts by being funded. You need to hear this. You need to know it. You need to learn it. You need to embed it in your DNA for those of you who are going to be entrepreneurs. And the second reason I'm here is some of you are on the fence about this whole entrepreneurship thing. And you're at the right age to do it. So I'm going to try and tip. If, if today I get one person in here to leap into it. You've got to get more than one. Well, one I'd be any. successful with one because, you know, I just heard someone when I was in the green room talking about fear and risk of making this commitment. But if you think about the journey of your life and how many phases you go through, you really want to do this in your 20s before you're burdened with all the other shit you're going to have to deal with. And there's plenty of that. But you can put 25 hours a day into entrepreneurship if you're young enough. And it takes about 15 to 20 years most of the time. Everybody thinks they get rich in three years. This doesn't happen that way. So you have to really get a head start on it, make your mistakes early, get that experience. And that's really what I'm trying to impart. So let's, let, we'll come back to the three components of a pitch, and we're going to perhaps even hear a couple. Yeah. So let's talk about sort of entrepreneurship, OK? And why, what is it about entrepreneurship that, should be, that is attractive to you? Why should it be attractive to these folks? I mean, they could all go get jobs making you know, they go work at McKinsey or places like yeah. this and make some pretty good money. Nothing wrong with that, but you are not an entrepreneur. When you're a consultant, any consultant. But I promise this would take at least five minutes. I can't no, no, I'm going here already. I am not. I'm just going to tell you the truth, OK? That's why they call me Mr. Wonderful. I tell the truth. You may not like the truth, but here's the truth. You will never make a consequential decision as a consultant. You will make a recommendation, and someone else will make that decision. I don't want to get down this, this road because I'm not against consultants. A third of you are going to become consultants. But you will never make a consequential decision. And when I see your resume later looking for a job as a CEO, that resume is going in the garbage. I would never hire a consultant to be a CEO, ever. Why? They have no experience in making consequential decisions. They don't know what it's like to make a consequential decision that's a mistake. That's experience you won't have as a consultant. And you will get that taint after two years of a consultant. So enjoy that life. There's nothing wrong with it. You get paid well. You work about 70 hours a week for somebody else. It's not your business. You are the modern financial slave. I'm not against it. <laughs> let's okay. stop with that. So let's talk about the, the pros of entrepreneurship as opposed to the cons of some of these other, other paths. Okay, so talk to me about, I mean, yes, you make consequential decisions that you're accountable for, right? The essence of learning, no question. Okay, but there is lots of risk, there's lots of failure, there's lots of crisis, there's lots of pressure. Yes, it's true. I rather invest, I'd rather invest in an entrepreneur that's had at least one failure. And I, I really prefer that because the sting of failure is extremely motivating. It's extremely motivating, and you will make many. The question is, will it be one that puts you out of business? And the great thing about mistakes and failures is, if you do this right, that is the essence of experience. You don't do it again. And so that's why I like people, you know, when they tell me, look, I, 
I've, I've started this startup and it failed and I'm coming back at it with what I've learned. That's very attractive. That, there's equity there. There's equity, there's personal executional excellence equity there. And very often it's the third deal that's the home run. And by the way, you only need one hit. You don't need 15. You just need one. And you've bought yourself personal freedom and, and the same freedom for your family. It's, it's a wonderful outcome, but it requires a tremendous sacrifice. There's no soccer on the weekends, no beach parties. When you're really in the groove of a business that's working, you're killing yourself, but you love it. Okay, I want to talk about um, a word that I think a lot of the HBO students are scared of, uh, which is commitment, okay? <laughs> so HBS is all about optionality. Right. Um, and calculating sort of risk-adjusted returns. Um, and so uh, I want you to talk a little bit about what it feels like to be committed to something. Well, I mean, you're taught in the, in the process of getting your MBA to maintain options at all time because there's value in optionality, but not on your career. That's the problem. You try and take that analogy or that you know, concept and bring it to your own path. Investors don't like that, number one. Employees that you're leading don't like that. They want to see 100% commitment, and that means you're all in. And, and you have to believe that yourself. You have to be able to, to communicate that, even though you may have doubts yourself. The definition of leadership is being able to get people to follow you. That's it. Mm -hmm. And if you, you can find extreme cases. Great leaders have that innate ability to get people to actually change direction and follow them because they believe in their vision and they believe in their direction. No one would ever do that if you're not 100% committed. They can smell your lack of commitment a mile away and they're ineffective leaders. That's one of the problems. Well, what I'd say is that you position it as the negative of not committing. What I'd say is magical, and many people know this, magic happens when you commit, frankly. Very many positive things and positive nodes occur precisely because you commit. But it's because the market sees the commitment. Correct. I mean, the employee, that, that, the prospective employee, the prospective investor, the prospective customer. Right. Sees it. Right. I mean, I, I, I kind of look at it and say, I meet so many entrepreneurs, and I'd, I'd like to add something here on, on this issue that I want you to think about. And I'm going to make it in the context of Shark Tank, because we none of us thought this thing would get as big as it, it is. And we've seen thousands of pitches, if not 10,000s of pitches. We're doing it the 15th year. One thing you don't know about this format that some of you think about, particularly the ones that are going to pitch here today, um, when they walk in that room, because of federal law made in the 60s, we're not allowed to know anything about them or their deal or have ever met them or ever seen a bio on them or anything. That's the law. It's the game show law. And so it's try and stop rigging. That's the whole idea, which happened a lot in radio and television in the 60s. So they walk on that carpet, and there's a stage manager that says to them, hold, 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 don't say anything, hold. And he's trying to get two shots, one from a jib that you always see in Shark Tank when you, they first walk out. That's from a thing on a crane. And then another shot of steady cam of a guy walking around them. And it takes about two minutes you can imagine how nervous they are, even though they practice a thousand times. Here they are with the 26 cameras on, 200 people in the you know, crew, and all the sharks there. This is their moment, 110 million eyeballs on television. I just look at them for that two minutes. I'm right in front of them. I don't smile. I don't blink. I just look at them, and I don't stop staring. <laughs> I've been doing this for quite a few years now. And I can tell with 100% accuracy, I've been 100% right for 10 years on this, winner, loser, before they even say a word. <laughs> and so how is that happening? When you walk into a room for the first time, before you say anything, you're presenting yourself for the first time. It's all in the eyes. You have to look at your counterparty that you're basically going to be negotiating with and push back at their stare with all the confidence in the world. The minute you start shuffling, smiling, laughing nervously, looking at the ground, you're f***ed right there. 
<laughs> okay, so the good news is for those that are pitching, you actually don't have to do anything but stand here and you'll be fine, okay? Okay, so let's talk about these pitches, okay? So what, what, are, what are these elusive three things yeah. that you most look for? Okay, so you six pitchers, listen to this because you better nail this. This is very important. The, these, these attributes are found, by the way, in multiple geographies and multiple languages because the format Shark Tank is owned by Sony and started in Japan. It's called Dragon's Den in Germany. It's called Dragon's, uh, sorry, Dragon's Lion's Den in Germany, Dragon's Den in Canada and the British Empire, um, Shark Tank in North and South America. But it's the same format. It's a license from Sony. So it's on in multiple languages, multiple entrepreneurs, multiple cultures. But it turns out that these three attributes are present in every single successful pitch. Number one, can you articulate the opportunity in 90 seconds or less? In other words, what is this idea that's so interesting that you're willing to commit your life to it? What is it? In fact, you should be able to do it in 60 seconds. If you're still rambling on, it means you don't know yourself what it is. You're trying to explain it, and it's not crystal clear. You can't articulate it. That's really important. Great ideas step right out of the box, and there they are. This is my idea, and this is why I'm here. Got it. Check the box. But great ideas are a dime a dozen. So number two is executional skills. What is it about you that can take this great idea and make it happen? Have you worked for a competitor? Is this a business your family ran for a while? Have you tried it three times before and failed to know what you did wrong? What is it about you that's going to take this great idea and be the right entrepreneur to execute on it? Because executional skills are really hard to find. Now, that takes longer than 90 seconds. However, when you get those two together, so the investor says, wait a second, great idea, executional skills here, I've got half my risk mitigated. But there's a third one, and this one is the killer. And this is where you can actually see tape of the air leaving the room. You've got a whole bunch of people that are really interested in investing in it. You'll definitely get one more, one, more than one offer if you get the first two right. Number three is this. You have to know your numbers. How big is the market? How fast is it growing? How many competitors are there? What's the break-even analysis on volume? All of those questions that are going to be hammered at you after they believe you're the right executional aspect of the deal, that is the diligence of trying to figure out your ability to speak the language and the metric of success, which is numbers. You have to know that. If you don't know them, then you should bring someone who does with you that understands the business model you're going to pursue. If you don't know your numbers, think about the context of Shark Tank. You've beaten out 120,000 applications. You're one of the 240 people on that stage an opportunity of a lifetime, a proven platform that can put you in front of 110 million people every year, and you don't know your numbers? You deserve to burn in hell in perpetuity, and I will personally put you there. That is my role in life. Okay, so what you guys don't know and what Linda and I can both attest to is all these statements he would say well before the show. Would you agree, Linda? Yeah. Okay. All right. So let's talk about these pitches. Okay. What are they? What are they gonna? What, what are they gonna win? Okay. So let's talk about the format. And the reason I talk about this to make this fair for everybody. I don't. I have not looked at the decks. I have. I have. I know nothing about their pitches. I barely know anything about them. I don't want to know anything. I want them to come out here and in 90 seconds tell me their fantastic idea, one after the other, and then only two of them are going to go to Hollywood after that. The others I'm firing because they didn't succeed in making it attractive enough because it's a beauty contest here. We've got six ideas. Only two are going to get the grill, and then there'll be one winner. That's the plan with this thing, and that's very fair. Very, very okay, fair. Okay, and so what the winner will get is an hour of your and your team's time to seriously to, con to make an investment. Yeah, I, I mean, Hold on. the and reason they would have got to the end is it probably has merit as a deal, yes. but they probably don't have a deck that's good enough to show to an investor. Either. Okay. And the second thing they do get, no matter what, if they win, is they get on Mr. Wonderful's social media. Yeah, we can do that. I mean, what, well, because we're going to take this and talk about this experience, and you know, I've got millions and millions of followers. How many, Kevin? 
A lot, yeah. Seven plus, <laughs> seven plus million. And so, and, but the thing about these followers is they're all entrepreneurs. And so I'm gonna show this, this team as the winner of this Harvard contest to everybody out there. And that's, a, that's very useful when you're talking to investors outside of my sphere. Okay. That's the whole point. And I okay. think that, so we're gonna, so one of the things is, um, I do have to say one thing, and I hope you'll, you know this. It's my, can I just humor me for one minute? And Kevin knows my dad. My dad is watching right now on Zoom, and it's his birthday today. So happy birthday, Dad. Um, OK. Um, OK, so just this, before you start, I yeah. want to do a shout out to an entrepreneur who had a lot of balls to come on Shark Tank. Um, Julia Rogers is in the audience right over there. She is a Shark Tank participant uh, and is an example of a successful pitch. Her deal is, hello, prenup. <laughs> I mean, basically taking the process of getting a prenup online. She's a lawyer, and I've always thought of lawyers as single-cell amoeba until I met her. <laughs> and this is something that everybody should have, but her pitch was flawless. It was flawless. Okay. So that's an ex and I, I, you know, we, we met today at Harvard to get an update on her business. She's killing it. And I said, why don't you come to this thing? So should we just forget about the Harvard people? And no, pitch? they okay. all want to be heard. Oh, okay. All right. All right. Okay. So here's the thing. I was a little worried that having Kevin here doing the Shark Tank thing, just given that you know things are a little bit more comfortable here than they were when I was uh, here, that you know Kevin might say something inflammatory um, <laughs> and get, get me in trouble. Um, so, so I wanted to find sort of the nicest pieces of Kevin um, when he turned deals down to inspire and defend and make the people that come up feel really strong. So um, hopefully this will provide some comfort and then we will, we, will, um, we will call our six pitchers to come down and we'll move over here while they show, while they show the next tape. You've got a real business, but you're a pig. You're greedy. You're not leaving anything for me to wet my beak with. Listen, Edwin, if you actually started to take any market share from the established sock makers, they could crush you like a vampire cockroach you are. Part of what I have to do every day is to, is to try and find opportunities where I put money in harm's way right. and I get a return. I don't pick places where there are thousands of dead and rotting corpses. I look for every way possible to find a reason to invest in you because I like death. It's inevitable. Okay, that's wonderful. But how do I make money off depressed people? No. <laughs> All right, so we've got six. Six brave pitchers after a very competitive process uh, that uh, that we picked. So if if our um, if the six of you can please make your way down to the tank. So we have IOCC, Michelle, Jasmine, Rowan, and Joe. <laughs> okay, so we're going to get started 90 seconds each, okay? Succinct, powerful, slower than you'd expect. And if you would do me a favor and give me the name of your deal right out of the top. What's it called? What's the business plan? Thank you. <clears throat> All right. Hey, everyone. My name is Io Ekator, and I'm the founder of All Street. Kevin, if there's one thing I can leave you with, it's three numbers. 16 million, 21 trillion, and less than 5%. 16 million is the number of accredited investors in the US. 21 trillion is how much money these people have to invest. Less than 5% is how much they actually invest in private funds. It's no secret that top tier private funds have historically outperformed stocks and bonds over a long period of time. So why is there such a gap? Not so easy, is it? 
No, not so, especially with the noise. Um, why is there such a gap? Um, one, because accessing these funds requires a $10 million minimum investment. And two, navigating your way to these funds. My idea is to provide access to private funds for retail investors. That's how you should have started your pitch. That's, that's the idea. That's yeah. the investment opportunity. Sure. Okay. You tell me why it's a great investment. How are you going to do that? So, All Street collects and aggregates smaller tickets with a minimum as low as $1 and partners with top tier funds to gain access. This is an issue I felt personally uh, while working at Blackstone. I was on a team that was investing in these types of funds. I did over $14 billion in deals, uh, all the while witnessing these eye popping returns, yet, I couldn't invest in these types of products on my own behalf. We take these smaller tickets, gain access to these funds, and so far we've got great traction. We've got two blue chip fund partners to date. We have a team that's currently building a mobile interface. We have a wait list of hundreds of prospective retail investors, and we are backed and advised by industry veterans from Blackstone, Apollo, and more. I think it would be amazing if all of us could invest in these outperforming funds. Why should wealth in an opaque process keep us on the outside? Okay, you're done. That's more than 90 seconds. Okay, thank you. <laughs> hey, let's go. All right, let's roll. Cece. Okay. Hi, I'm Cece, and I'm the founder of Hydropops. We are seeking $100,000 in return for 10%, or as the king of royalties, we're open to negotiation. So <laughs> we've heard from, through the grapevine that you have a passion for wellness and longevity. And as a team of former athletes and current MBA students, we understand the importance of maintaining hydration. Um, sorry. <laughs> um, we understand the importance of maintaining hydration. Currently, 75% uh, of Americans are chronically dehydrated and consumers are becoming increasingly interested in products that benefit their health. However, the current hydration products on the market don't best support the health of the consumer. They have added dyes, sugars, and ingredients that we can't even pronounce. And that's why we created Hydropops. Hydropops are electrolyte popsicles that uh, offer a healthy and fun way to rehydrate without all the nonsense. No chemicals, no dyes, no added sugars. Um, they are shelf stable and only 30 calories, and we have two flavors, apple and orange mango, which you guys can now try for yourselves. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> the global, Thanks. thank you, Mateo. The global sports drink market is, exposed, is expected to nearly double to over 50 billion by 2030, and we are compelled to take a chunk of that by tapping into a new approach of functional hydration. We have validated demand at farmers markets and e-commerce, and we're looking forward to scaling production and growing via B2B partnerships in e-commerce. And that's where we can leverage your expertise. Um, we want to help others perform their best, so let's stay hydrated and grow this popsicle stand. Okay, Michelle. Always bring a demo if you have one. <laughs> All right. Hi, I'm Michelle, and I'm the co-founder of Appregator. We're a provider of e-commerce software. Kevin, have you ever bought something online on a website and then walked into the same company's store only to be told that they have none of your information, you can't use the loyalty points there? How frustrating is that? Today, it's easier than ever for people to launch direct-to-consumer businesses, but it's harder than ever to deliver a great experience. As consumer expectations continue to increase and merchants have so many more tasks to do, they need to do personalized SMS and emails, they need to do orders, fulfillment, returns. And so on average, a merchant uses 10 different apps to power their e-commerce store on top of something like a Shopify or a Magento. The problem is when your website inevitably slows down or when you want to move from one sales channel to another, you need to reach out to 10 different developers who are all then pointing fingers at each other. My co-founder, Mark, and I co started Appregator earlier this year to solve that exact problem. We provide, we buy and acquire, we build and acquire outstanding e-commerce software applications and provide merchants with an integrated suite of software 
that helps them reach their customers on whichever sales channel they want to shop. Mark used to work in private equity, and I've spent my entire life working with direct-to-consumer brands, and we believe that we're the perfect team to solve this. Since this past summer, we've done two acquisitions, raised VC and family office funding, and grown annualized revenue to over $600,000. Kevin, we'd love to gain from your insights in the e-commerce space and partner with you as we take Aptogator to the next level. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, Jasmine's up. I'm up. Hi, Kevin. My name is Jasmine Smoots, and I'm the founder of NOLA. Raise your hand if you have student loan debt. Whoa. Right, right. How much do you have? $200,000. $200,000. Well, according to Reza, any HBS grad should be able to walk out of here and make at least $200,000 a year, so you're fine. <laughs> but you know who's not fine? Amber. Amber is a doctor in New York City working 14-hour days to keep people like you and me healthy. She has over $300,000 in debt and a monthly payment equal to her rent. She wants to give 100% to her patients, but she's unfocused, thinking about how to get her debt forgiven. Governments offer loan forgiveness programs for public servants like Amber, but they're incredibly hard to access. Why? Because the nine million public servants that qualify for these programs are great at what they do, but not great at following paperwork. That's why less than 2% of public servants have been able to get access to loan forgiveness. Nearly one third of denied claims are because of incomplete or incorrect paperwork. And the rest are for things that can easily be solved. That's why I created NOLO. NOLO is a web platform to make getting loan forgiveness simple. How? By helping public servants find different loan forgiveness programs, easily tracking their eligibility year over year, and helping them file their application to make sure that it's accurate and complete and on time every time. With NOLO, our public servants can focus on the things that they do best instead of focusing on their student debt. Thank you. Okay, Rowan, you're up. Hello, Shark. I'm Rohan, the founder of Penguin AI. Have any of you ever sold anything online? Amazon, Shopify, you name it. I want to help all of you sell more product online for faster and cheaper with unlimited AI-generated content and advertising. If you are an SMB brand, it is incredibly expensive to sell because of all of the visual assets you have to create. You spend hundreds of dollars for each new product SKU on product photographers, on Photoshop experts, maybe thousands, if not tens of thousands of dollars on creative marketing agencies. There has to be a better way. AI is already changing marketing as we speak. Companies like Jasper AI and many others have automated the creation of blogs using text-based models, and these companies are doing well. Jasper AI has went from zero to 100 million in revenue in 18 months with only nine people. And while Jasper AI has doubled down on text generation, I believe the market has an opening in visual content creation. I'm a machine learning researcher formerly at Google Research and at Waymo, and I want to bring the next generation of visual generative AI models to the future of content creation for marketing and advertising. We have 20 alpha users. We're releasing to the public next week. We are backed by Y Combinator. We would love to leverage your network of D2C e-commerce brands in our go-to-market and launch. So perhaps it is time for the penguins to be swimming with the sharks. <laughs> All right, Joe. Hi, Kevin. I'm Joe Bromofsky, co-founder of Algoma Homes. So who here would ever consider living in a skyscraper made of wood? A few of you, not that many. Let's see how many I can convince over the next 90 seconds. So I worked in construction and engineering for seven years before Harvard, working for the biggest contractors and designers in the industry. And there were three problems that I saw repeatedly. One, a shortage of housing. 
the US alone needs 7 million new homes to meet current demand. Two, sustainability. Construction and engineering contributes 40% of global greenhouse gases, mainly through the production of concrete and steel. And three, efficiency. The construction and engineering industry is very inefficient. It's averaged 1% productivity growth over the last 10 years. And you compare that to something like manufacturing, which has averaged 6% productivity growth every year. So how do we solve these issues? Algoma Homes will design and build mass timber residential towers that are carbon neutral, 25% faster to build, and aesthetically beautiful. They'll be carbon neutral because we'll use mass timber, a form of engineered wood that's super strong and fire resistant. And we'll be able to build them 25% faster because of our repeatable design and the fact that we're using manufacturing processes to improve efficiency. So yes, this solution has the opportunity to have a massive impact on the environment, but it's also an amazing business opportunity and an opportunity to disrupt a $1.8 trillion market. Thanks very much. I'm going to bring them all up now. I'm going to bring them all up. Okay, can all six of you, if all six of you can come up. Um, now before, we're going to give Kevin a second before he asks questions. Let's just do a quick audience uh, clap here, okay? So who, who would vote right now for All Street? <laughs> okay. Okay, Hydro Pops. <laughs> okay, Aggregator. All right, Nolo. Okay, Penguin AI. <laughs> And Algoma Homes. See, see the, the amazing thing is, there was no information in any of that. <laughs> all right, so I'm going to ask the same question of all of you, so we can just go right down the aisle. So start here. Okay, well, it doesn't matter which side. Well, I just feel like, question. you know. Well, he's got the mic. All right, but all start right. where the microphone okay. is. So, in, in venture capital right now, the when you go through the diligence process, the first question you get after you've explained the opportunity, and the only question that matters right now is, do you understand your customer acquisition cost and some strategy of how you're going to acquire your customers? Because what's happened after the pandemic over the last 30 months is most businesses have moved to a 50-plus direct-to-consumer model. They were forced to do it when distribution channels shut down. And so they've also found their margins are 40% better that way, and they get something that's more valuable than anything else. They get data. They know their customer preferences, the flavors, where they buy it from, when they buy it, frequency. And so for investors like me, and I'm not the only one looking at this, is if we can understand CAC, customer acquisition cost, and you've already figured it out or you have a plan, and you know that your CAC is less than lifetime value, when I give you a million or five million or ten million dollars, I'm just putting gasoline on the fire. You've already figured it out. And so I'm going to accelerate the value of your business by just pursuing the path of least resistance because you've already figured it out. So the question to all of you is, how are you going to acquire customers and what's it going to cost you? Let's start right here. Okay, sure. So my customers are accredited investors, someone who's like late 20s to early 30s, uh, can't afford to get in directly, so has to pay us. Can, but can afford like a 5K Well, I know check. who they are, but how are you going to acquire them? And so to that person, I envision a direct-to-consumer approach where we are advertising through social, through paid search. Uh, there's also, I think, in the future, room for, call it a B to B to C play, where we are finding the, call it long tail of financial advisors who advise these types of people. These advisors can't get access to these types of funds. And so we are going to them, giving them access that they can then offer to their clients. Uh, I think that reduces the CAC uh, because in ways I think that makes sense. Um, but initially direct to consumer and then B2B to C. Well, look, Kevin, this is a problem you and I have talked about in the past. So it's an interesting idea, right? How right. do you actually democratize private equity investing? How do you access it to, private, uh, to retail investors? 
So you obviously have a retail distribution channel or presence, okay? No one has actually cracked this nut yet. No. Nope. And so I'm not sure what we're hearing cracks the nut, um, but it's a problem that needs to be solved. Even the behemoths like SoFi are suffering this. They're having a really hard time acquiring customers. They're disrupting the banking system, but their customer acquisition costs are massive because it's so competitive. But the idea has merit, but really until you crack CAC, as I like to say, you're going to have a huge problem. I mean, that, capital pursues CAC. That's what happens now. And it's really changed in the last 12 months because Investors really want to feel that you've done all the dirty work to get, get this set up, but that's why I'm asking the same question of all of you. So let's move the mic down the line. Yeah, so for Hydropops, we're looking more- This is your partner and says nothing? <laughs> okay, so you said to is bring a numbers mute? guy. I brought the numbers guy. <laughs> all right. Uh, Mateo, nice to meet you. <laughs> Very good. Very good. Uh, I'll jump into the channel strategy and he can add on the numbers. So our channel strategy, we want to utilize B2B partnerships as a brand building mechanism. So we have three different segments we want to target. One, after drinking. Two, athletics, sports teams, gyms. And then three, sick kids, patients, hospitals. Every time someone has surgery, they get popsicles after. Why not electrolyte popsicles? So you're going to do this on a free handout basis, or how you're going to spend cost. advertising dollars digitally? What are you going to do? We're no gonna... one's ever heard of Hydropops. Nobody. They, so, they're good, by the way. They're good. Thank you. We're going to utilize B2B partnerships as a brand building mechanism by offering the product at cost, and then invest in online marketing to fuel the D2C growth. OK. All right. Just add a quick thing there. Oh, he speaks. <laughs> <laughs> what do you know? Um, right now, our, we produced at 75 cents and we've sold at two to three dollars so we're already like positive you know we have profit margins you charge on three dollars for a pop yeah so far we have more demand than we can handle but that's exactly so i can where either you get in. a hydro pop or i can go to harvard <laughs> sounds like an easy choice to me or you can buy a six dollar latte got it okay i get it i get it. this is where you would come in presumably with your access to the millions and millions of followers. The word presumably seems a little gratuitous. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Hopefully, more than presumably. Hi, I'm Mark. I'm Michelle's Quant. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, I'm a co-founder of Appregator. So we uh, get all our traffic organically today through the App Store. So we pay zero dollars to acquire customers. Longer term, um, our CAC, we think based on competitors, is in the $300 range. And our LTV is at $1,200, or about a four times multiple. Um, and we think that Google advertising, in-store, uh, app advertising is the most effective way to get our customers. Okay. All right. Nolo's going to be a B2B business. It's not really fair or equitable to ask these public servants to pay for this offering. So we're going to their employers, health systems, school districts, nonprofits. At this point, after year one at least, the only CAC will be my salary because there's not going to be an expense of going through Facebook or any other kinds of social media. Does this site exist already? It's going to be launching soon. Oh, I see. OK, so you haven't tried this out yet. You haven't gone to an employer to see how long the cycle is. I haven't gone to acquire sale on the site. This summer, I've done a pilot with actual teachers, making sure that we can actually get them loan forgiveness or get on track to it before trying to sell into school districts, because the last thing we want to do is sell something that we can't actually deliver. Right. OK. Uh, so we are targeting creative marketing teams and e-commerce D2C brands. Uh, and, and so presumably, I, I shouldn't say presumably, <laughs> if we get the chance to work together, uh, I want to be able to leverage your excellent, excellent network of D2C brands, because uh, I hear you are the D2C expert, to be able to organically grow in the shorter term. In the longer term, we want to target this population using traditional creative advertising techniques. These sites you have that are alpha testing this stuff, what feedback are they giving you? So the, the broader alpha was actually around using generative AI to assist with design use cases. We actually tailored it down towards the new vision to focus on creative marketing after hearing that giving AI design tools without being purpose driven doesn't lead to useful outcomes. You need to cater the flows to the things marketing teams care about. They care about the set of downstream tasks beyond just image generation distributions to different omni-channel outlets, click-through rates, all of that.
And so while generating the assets a good starting point, there will be a there's a larger value chain that we need to be able to service in order to be compelling over time. Got it. Okay. So we're also B2B. We are selling to developers. So these are the people who own the sites, sort out the permits. Um, and our value proposition to them is if you can build something in 25% of the time, the thing they care about most is IRR. So if you can do your construction 25% faster, they're going to bite your hand off. And in, they can also get repeat business. They own multiple sites. You do a good job on one of them. You should prove the model, prove the benefits. They're going to put you on other sites. And that's repeat business with no extra Do you have no any idea cap. of use case? What sector is going to use this? Is it residential? Is it commercial? Re residential and office are the two most likely. But we're focusing on residential. And have, have you built one of them somewhere? We haven't built one of them yet, no. OK. OK, this is why you get paid the big bucks, my friend. Yeah, this is a tough one. Tough, very tough. Um, it's good, it's tough. I'm going to do a little drama. I'm going to go touch both of you. <laughs> I like that whole idea, right? So it's kind of like I drift around a little bit right here. Okay. So who's the, who's the okay. Okay. All right. So I think, unfortunately, the rest of you must leave. But thank you. Thank you. <laughs> okay. So why don't you guys step up? All right. And I just want to say something about both pitches. Um, I was a little critical that you didn't deliver what the idea was right out of the gate, but it didn't cost you that much. But the point is, these are very defined markets, very addressable markets, and in both cases, pretty large markets. And so really, because it's so nascent, so early, it's more now about determining what you think the path is to acquire customers and getting that customer acquisition cost low. Because you know, I've seen this NOLO model before, in educational loan grants, and it really works. And so the question becomes, can you get, and I'm going to start with you, how, who are you going to go into the enterprise to engage so that they're going to use this product? Let's say, you, you give me an example. Which individual do you have to get to? Yeah, I think that when you're thinking about, for instance, a school district, people who are serving all of our teachers, sure. you're really going to go to who, the... Who, who's the person that would pull the trigger for you in a school district? It's typically going to be the COO of a school district or of a private school. My mom works in private education, and every, every private school she's worked at has a COO or a CFO who's making these decisions to figure out who's going to improve our employee benefits to make it easier for teachers who honestly work for oftentimes scraps have the actual is ability it, to do this. Are you going to do teachers first? Are you going to do nurses? Are you going to do both? I'm going to start with teachers. Teachers are actually what I know. Like I said, I'm the proud mother, I'm the proud daughter, granddaughter, and stepdaughter of teachers, and that's where I'm going to work. My stepmom has been working in the Lawrenceville School District for almost 20 years, has a ton of different connections, and they're already interested in figuring out what we can do to help get teachers loan forgiveness. Mm, OK. So you're going to roll this out by school district, you think? I think the school district level is honestly the best way to do it. One, when you're looking at the public service loan forgiveness program, eligibility is based on school district, not individual school. Two, when teachers leave schools, it's typically within their own district because they're not going to uproot their entire families or leave their state to have a you know, brand new job and have to buy a new house. And so I think school district level is going to be the best way to do it. Additionally, school districts talk to one another. So if you hear teachers having this really great, awesome employee benefit, people would either be incentivized to come there or the and other these school. These are teachers that are just starting that have debt from their education. That's the idea. No, this is teachers who already have it and those that are beginning. It takes 10 years before you can get your loans forgiven. But if you aren't annually certifying your employment and you aren't annually filing, it's going to be a pain in the butt to get your forgiveness so you're gonna, after you're 10 years. You're going to be working with these people for a decade? For a decade. That's how, how long it takes. How much are they going to who pays you? What's the business model? How do you make money? The business model is having the employers pay on a user basis. So if we say that most school districts have 
more than 1,000 employees, I think at that number, we're looking at something around 500 per school district. And so you're sticking with them for year after year after year. Just $500 a year? Potentially higher. We're still testing this out. You're going to make hundreds of dollars. Like, that's, that's not enough. It could also honestly be higher. We're trying to figure it out. Like I mentioned, school districts are one of the things we're talking about. Also looking at nonprofits. A ton of nonprofits have, you know, five to ten employees. So at something like that, we might be charging closer to $100 per month for the entire organization. But it's something that's still in flex, figuring out what economics are going to yeah, make the gonna, most sense and to... be able to actually get the schools to pay. Schools often don't pay, but this is a retention tool. People are making $58,000 at best per year. And the only way to actually improve their, likely, their livelihood is either to improve their pay, which they can't do, or decrease their debt so they have a higher net worth. If we can get them to pay some amount, even if it's $10 per head, that's going to have a massive impact for all of their employees. Okay. All right, let's talk about private equity now. Sure. Um, it's an interesting idea. And it's been tried before. Um, the challenge always was that you have to get access to the funds. Now, in your case, are you providing a minimum investment so that you're going to a Bain or TH Lee or whoever you're going to and saying, look, I'll commit to bringing in $5 million minimum or something? Why should they care about you if you're bringing all these fractional amounts in? Yeah, it's a great question. So over the summer, I connected with 40 firms and had this discussion. And what I learned over those conversations was these firms realize that retail is the future. These firms have historically only targeted the endowments and pensions of the world, and today are feeling the, the effects that these institutional LPs have full bellies. They cannot allocate any more to private equity. Harvard endowments, 66% invested in private markets. That number can't get any higher. So when I talk to these LPs and I say, hey, I'm doing this, they're like, makes sense because we want to double our assets and our LP base is 50, 60 percent invested. So Retail is 5 percent. You don't think there's a there. minimum hurdle for you? In other words, for, in, in order to engage and set you up as a provider and go through all the compliance nightmare that they have to to put you on their platform, they're not going to require a minimum from you? No. No, the two fund partners that I've got to date have well, actually... Why don't, you t why don't you tell them who they are? I don't know if I can say that. Okay. Do, would I know are, them? Private. But they're they, great names. Yes, you, yeah, you know them. Would put your money they're not Dewey, Cheatham, and Howe. They're real people, right? No, they're legit. You may have money in them now, but they're legit. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Look, it's, it, this is the number one complaint right now of, of fundraising. In particular, funds are seven or eight or nine. They've tapped out all of their LPs. I get it. That's intriguing. That's very intriguing. What's the business model? How many BIPs are you putting in of friction? for the retail investor? Because let's say they're two and 20 that you're dealing with, what happens? Yeah, so I am charging a 1% or 100 basis points on top of the underlying two and 20, and then an additional 5% performance fee. What, so, is there a hurdle on the performance? I'm playing with that. I'm out right now fundraising for this first product and testing what makes sense to the prospective LPs in my fund product and we'll see what they come back with in terms of whether that 1% management fee makes sense, does that 5% work with them, hurdle or not. Do you think you can get on the online platforms like a Schwab or a TD or Fidelity and offer it as a product, or it has to be accredited investor? It has to be accredited investors in the way that I've understood so it. Is there a minimum? N there's no minimum amount that... I can put $250 in it? You can put a dollar in. It may not make sense for me to service a dollar, but well, in the way I'm that I'm saying, I've, are you going to set a minimum of that? Yeah, so, so far, we've got hundreds of people on our wait list. So we're going back to them to under, ask these questions. What's the minimum that would make sense for you? What types of products do you care about? Yeah. And we're centering around 2,500 as a number that's approachable um, in terms of minimum. And we think that that works for the math works for us as well. At that. Yeah. Okay. In the first two years, how much AUM do you think you can build? What's your target? Think, assets under management. How much cash can you raise? How, how many assets under management? Uh, I think there's a possibility to get to 100, 150 million dollars across three different portfolio products. Call it a private equity, venture capital, real estate. Uh, the supply side isn't as hard as I thought it would be, based on my summer conversations. The question really is, how how 
I think it's the customer acquisition that. that's tough. Yeah. I think the supply, I agree with your thesis, that they want an, an alternative distribution channel. That's interesting. Okay. So listen, I think we got to make a decision. Yeah. Okay. And so, first of all, my question is, and this, no one's going to answer this because, uh, well, let's see, I'm hoping someone will. Does anyone have a view as to which of these two they would rather invest in? <laughs> anyone want any anyone from the audience want to want to give an opinion? Yeah, have some guts. Get up there and say something. Who has something? I'm a, okay, great. Yes. For which one you're skeptical? The, the loan forgiveness, Tam. Yeah. Uh, what, what's your skepticism based on? So I, I think the number up there was nine million uh, potential. Uh, was that was was that right or? It's nine million today, but again, it takes ten years to get forgiveness, so it's continually growing. Right, and so you're selling into, you know, I think these government. Uh, um, agencies where, you know, obviously they're tight budgets. I agree, that's a good issue, but it's also a moat. You don't get a whole lot of competition because it's such a nightmare from hell dealing with the education system. Right. No, tr true, but it's also a long sales cycle. Right. Um, yeah. I think for that reason, I'd go Wall Street. Got it. Okay. Interesting. All right. Kevin. Oh, it's tough. These are both interesting ideas. Um, it's just classic. How do, you, how do you make the decision? What's your framework for making the decision? I don't get emotional. I'm not I think, expecting I think you about my money as soldiers. They go out to do battle and they got to come home with prisoners. That's the, <laughs> that's the whole idea. And, and so I want to, and I don't want them to die out there. You know, that's the whole idea. <laughs> so it's, I'm going to go with Wall Street. How good was that? There you go. was How fun. good was that? Well done. Talk about it. Yeah. I could help you. Okay, so. Thank you very much. It's a good idea. I wish it was very much. Okay, so I just want to say a couple of things, right? So, you know, I remember when I was in business school, a phrase that I learned from one of my greatest HBS professors, a guy named Bill Solomon, and another fellow named Howard Stevenson, who talked, who provided me with a definition of entrepreneurship, which I think has been stamped on my forehead, and my daughter could recite it if I asked her to. Entrepreneurship is a relentless pursuit of opportunity without regard to resources currently controlled, right? And it's that last half which is the most important, without regard to resources currently controlled, right? It's the ability to actually imagine that something's possible and that you can actually have that idea, despite the fact that people that have far more resources, capital, and experience, experience have missed it, okay? And so when I watch this, what's really interesting is Io did not do a very strong job pitching. Okay, like he did not do a very good job. I mean, I put him first because I thought he was going to nail it. All right, and and he fumbled. Okay, but he sh he showed resilience, and in it there was some sort of a connection. Okay, some sort of a connection that clearly uh, um, uh, Kevin responded to. Okay, so I mean, I, I hope. I mean, Kevin, I want to give you the last word on what you think of the quality of the pitches and, and perhaps around entrepreneurship. But I would inspire all of you, you know, to at least believe that coming out of HBS, it is entirely possible for you to build a business of significance, achieve the freedom that so many entrepreneurs strive for and so many people want so that you can have the impact that you all so justly want to have. Okay, so with that, let me give Kevin the last word. Yeah, thank you. This was terrific. And I, I all, to all of you, I, I would say that um, being able to stand in front of your colleagues and your peers and pitch is never easy, but you'll be doing it for the rest of your life in any context. And so the things that I've learned that really matter for the pursuit of success as a manager, if you pursue that path, or more importantly as an entrepreneur, is communication skills. The ability to actually deliver the idea of 90 seconds and then explaining your executional abilities really matters, and knowing your numbers, we've gone through that. But there's something else that has emerged that I don't think is going to go away uh, that is a skill set you should start to think about. And I've encouraged your faculty to modify your teaching for this because 
What's this is actually true, Mitch. He, yeah. he did this at lunch today. I'm an open critic every time I'm here. I'm happy to do it. Um, <laughs> but, you know, the, the, what's, what's happened to our economy in the last 30 months is the emergence of using social media to acquire customers for big and small companies alike. And these platforms that are merging all the time, TikTok was nowhere five years ago, and it's now the fastest growing platform. It may get outlawed. Who knows? It doesn't matter. But all of my companies now are modifying how they do business in acquiring customers. Because you can't use Facebook the way you used to. You can't use Twitter. What's occurred to the privacy laws through Apple's operating system has dropped yields 80% on Facebook. And so the only way you can start to do CAC exercises and buying commercials is you've got to bash it with other data. You have to become proficient in understanding how to use social media. It doesn't mean you're the technician, but you have to make it something you really understand as a manager. And so I'm encouraging you to start thinking about how does TikTok work and what's it different and how is it you know, different than LinkedIn? And how is it different than what you do on Insta or on Facebook? And we have been able to get our yields back up about 20% using all kinds of alternative strategies. And we're spending a lot of money on it. But I don't find enough in your, in your curriculum addressing this issue. And I, because I, I meet a lot of you after you graduate, and you know shit about social media. And that's not good. That is something you should okay, make. And, and to end on an uplifting note, you're right. I always try to tell the truth. That's it. OK, for those of you that watch this tonight, make this a priority. Jump into the fray and give it a shot. Be an entrepreneur before you're a consultant. Do that. You know what I say? Be the person that hires a consultant. Don't be a consultant. Thank you very much. <laughs> Thank you. 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 Thank you.